making their way across. Um, I am delighted uh, to see you all here and thank you all for coming to our second um, external speaker event in our external speaker series of the International Law and Human Rights Unit. Um, we are very privileged to have uh, Professor Rosa Friedman with us this, up, this evening. Um, Rosa Friedman is currently the uh, chair at, a chair of Reading in Global no Law, Conflict and Development, and the director of the New Conflicts Division. So sort of Global, Global Development. Development Division is the new in, interdisciplinary center uh, for looking at global issues. Um, Rosa is an expert, particularly in the United Nations and the United Nations Human Rights Council in particular, has written a number of books. I was just wondering earlier today how you managed one in 2013 and <laughs> 2014 on the politicization of human rights on the one hand at the UN and also on the UN, uh, UN Human Rights Council as it is um, how it's going in year six, year seven, no, year ten, ten of its operations ten. at this point. She also writes a lot on the special procedures of the United Nations Human Rights Council and on other uh, related issues of human rights um, and the United Nations and beyond. Um, this afternoon, Rosa was, uh, we had a very quick lunch this afternoon because Rosa was on Al Jazeera talking about the UN's failure uh, in Syria. I won't say failure to do what because utter failure in Syria. And appears, I was recently traveling and was awake at 7 a.m. in the morning doing work felt a bit lonely, turned on the television, and Rosa was there talking about the UN Human Rights Council, and I think it was on Saudi Arabia, perhaps, at the time, and its membership <laughs> of the council. At any rate, so she's appearing on television and radio regularly on uh, UN and human rights issues, and this afternoon she's going to speak to us about the Human Rights Council and the politicization of human rights. So I'll pass over to Rosa, and thank you again for coming to Liverpool. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and for that very nice introduction. Um, Sorry, I find these microphones really strange. Can you all hear me? Yeah, excellent. Um, 10 years ago, the United Nations Human Rights Council was born. And that was the first time I walked into what was room 20 in Geneva. Um, it looks a little bit like a palace. There are peacocks strutting around outside. There's lots of big grassy verges and statues that have been donated by many countries. And this sort of Geneva compound is always silent until the Human Rights Council session starts, at which point member states uh, send their ambassadors in very nice cars and civil society come and line up to pick up their badges because NGOs are allowed to attend Human Rights Council sessions. They're allowed to talk at sessions. Members of the public, you would all be allowed to go and observe a session as long as you get your badge in advance. And all of a sudden it turns into this sort of hubbub of a, a human rights world where you have every single issue and most nationalities from around the world represented. And the first time I walked in, I was expecting it to be a very somber occasion. Um, I walked into the room and I realized that people were sitting around in a big circle, as you would expect from any UN body. But most people were on their mobile phones, most of the ambassadors, or having a sandwich, having a chat with their friends. Um, Occasionally an ambassador would walk in and would pick up the talking points that he or she was given, mainly his, uh, by their staff and would make their statement and then wander back out again. And um, the translation, um, in the UN you have six languages that are official languages, English, which I speak, French, which I don't, Arabic, Chinese, Russian, and Spanish, which I have nothing of. Um, so you have these little earpieces next to every chair and the translation was terrible. Um, the translators were sort of wandering in and out and not taking it very seriously. And if you didn't speak all six languages, you were going to miss lots of things. Um, and I tell you this because it's changed drastically. The last time I went to the Human Rights Council, there was no lunch break. Instead of starting at 10, stopping at 12, everyone having a glass of wine with lunch, starting in at 3 and ending at 5.30, they were starting at 8.30 in the morning and on some nights they were going through till 10.30 at night. They're taking human rights clearly more seriously at the UN. And um, the book that I wrote, the first book that I wrote on this, really tried to unpack what was going on at this body, not in terms of the law of what the body should do, but in terms of the practice, the fact that so many states were clearly not taking it seriously. We're treating this as a place to talk about trade over lunch, 
or a place to discuss what had gone on in terms of the refugee agency up the road or a place to see people that they hadn't seen for a while. Um, whereas today, countries take it seriously. And um, what I want to talk to is how over 10 years, a political body that's made up of 47 member states, which is about a quarter of the UN membership, that are elected for fixed terms and then have to rotate out, which gives every state a chance, at least, to stand for the body. How, over 10 years, which might be a long time in our lifetimes, but certainly in terms of international law is a very short period of time, how human rights and the UN has become a much more serious game, but also how the body now is being used for things that are so far removed from human rights, because countries have recognised that it's a very powerful body and therefore are trying to use it to advance their own objectives. So the starting point really is that in 1948, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which was a very nice declaration, which lots of us think of as containing fundamental rights, which it does, prohibition against torture, the right to life, the right to food, but also, if you ever need to claim it, the right to leisure, which no one ever talks about. Um, I often try and claim a right to leisure. No one ever listens to me. I'm not sure what leisure is, but it's, it's there in the declaration. Um, and it represented the views of the 50 or 60 countries at the time that were countries, most of which were actually colonial empires. Um, and it certainly didn't represent the views of those countries that were under colonial rule. And the UN recognised that human rights would be an important aspect of its work, but certainly not an aspect of its work that needed its own principal organ. We have the Security Council for Peace and Security, we had the General Assembly to represent all UN member states, and then we had this sort of Human Rights Commission that fell under a principal organ called ECOSOC, which was around economics and social sort of aspects of life. Um, and the Commission did fairly well, actually. Um, it advanced this idea of what are human rights what's the substance of them, how can we implement them in the world, what should member states try and take up, um, and the development of rights. Um, and it also did very well because during the Cold War, it was one of the few bodies that wasn't paralyzed by the kind of Russia-US vetoes. Um, but towards the end of its lifespan, lots of people say it failed, I don't think it failed, it had become incredibly politicized. If you were a member of the commission, you can make sure that the commission can never look at your own human rights abuses. And if you're a member of the commission, you could use that as leverage against countries that you didn't like to make sure that they were on the table. And the commission completely failed to look into things like genocides. Um, it failed to be an early warning system to the Security Council about what was going on in Rwanda or in Yugoslavia. Um, and it only met for six weeks a year. So. I can't do maths very well, but for the other 46 years of 46 weeks of the year, um, if a crisis happened, well, a crisis happened, it couldn't do anything about it because it wasn't sitting in session. And when Kofi Annan, who clearly felt, and this isn't an evidential basis, but he'd been sort of fairly high up during the Rwandan genocide and clearly felt sort of some need to make changes in the body when he became Secretary General, one of the key things he looked at was reforming the UN human rights machinery to try and make it work better, not just on human rights themselves as, as a sort of sole substantive aspect, but on mainstreaming human rights across all of the UN's work. And the key thing he focused on was that the commission was not working and it was time for a human rights council. In the political world of 193 member states, where not much happens and it never happens quickly, everyone thought this was really quite funny. Um, this idea that he thought he could get rid of a UN body and build a new one. Um, and he came up with this report called In Larger Freedom, and he really sort of went around garnering support, and people still didn't take it very seriously. And then suddenly in 2005, it became clear that the Human Rights Commission, the Commission on Human Rights was going to be disbanded and the Human Rights Council was going to be built. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about should we have 18 member states and have experts sitting on this body so that it's not about state politics or should we have it being a universal body with 193 member states so that everyone's represented and in the end uh, we we got to 47 member states which was a whole six fewer than the commission but what they did get to was the idea of ge proportionate geographic representation 
there's five regional groups at the UN, the African group, the Asian group, the group of Latin American and Caribbean states, the Western European and others group and the Eastern European group. Um, these these groups were created many many decades ago so the eastern european group actually includes many eu members these days but these are sort of largely based on a kind of russet's criteria of what makes a region there's geographic sort of similarities and similar histories and so on and it was at least felt that you know in 2006 the un membership was so materially different to in 1945 that given that the african group is the biggest group it should have more states or the same amount of states as the Asian group. And the Western European and others group is now pretty small proportionately compared with the others, and they should have fewer states. So we, we had that change. And we also had a big change that in order to stand for membership of this body, you had to have some kind of pledges or commitments to uphold human rights. And that pledges and commitments are pretty soft, right? There was a there was a proposal that known grave human rights abusers should not be able to stand but given that every country in the world from sweden to somalia abuses human rights in some form that would have been pretty difficult to do and actually what would have happened would have been we'd have had the scandinavian countries sitting there and every other country would have seen this as an illegitimate body because it wasn't actually representative of their views um, one of the key things that they said and that was implemented is that the human rights council sits for at least 10 weeks a year throughout the year spread out into four sessions with the ability to have special sessions when needed. So if a crisis hits, you don't have to wait until the next session to deal with a genocide going on on the ground. Um, and also there were new mechanisms that were developed. Um, the Universal Periodic Review, whereby every single country, no matter whether they're Tuvalu or China, no matter whether they're a member or not, every country over a four and a half year period is reviewed in terms of its own domestic human rights records. So there was these incremental steps towards recognizing that human rights are universal and that the UN has this sort of mandate and duty and responsibility to look at human rights in every country from a hopefully less selective, less biased, depoliticized point of view, which is really idealistic. And I assume most people in here are lawyers and that's what we are. We're trained to be idealistic. We're trained to think about what ought to happen. Um, what did happen in the first few years was not the ideals. Many countries stood for membership of this body because they were worried about what might happen on this body and they wanted to change it, often not for the right reasons. Um, Russia was there, Pakistan was there, Cuba was there, Egypt was there. Um, I say these countries not because they're the worst human rights abusers, but because they were the countries that were at the fore of trying to make sure that this body worked in their favor from a procedural point of view. The United States refused to engage with it. It was George W. Bush. So they said, we'll happily pay for it, but they voted against its creation and they didn't stand for membership. Um, China took a, a really strong view in most, uh, most conversations in the first two years. It constantly talked about human rights as being a very bad thing because, and it's my favorite quote, and they said it so many times, human rights are a neo-colonial tool of oppression, which they may well be, but for China to say that is um, half laughable. Um, and the first few years were really pretty grim. Um, the council tried to get rid of some of the human rights mechanisms that we rely on, the system of independent experts and special rapporteurs who are unpaid, often academics or lawyers or NGO people that go out and look at torture or look at extrajudicial killing or look at the right to food or look at situations like Israel and the occupied territories or Haiti. Um, and then make reports and recommendations. The council doesn't like them or didn't like them because they might actually come into your country and criticize you or criticize you from afar. Um, the council also tried to roll back, countries in the council tried to roll back, and uh, I'll explain that in a minute, but they tried to roll back on fundamental rights. So they might not have liked the idea of the rights of religious minorities. So they were trying to advance this idea that defamation of religion is a right. You've all heard of Charlie Hebdo. Yeah, nods maybe um the the sort of justification amongst some countries for the charlie hebdo shootings is that um defamation of someone's religion is against a religion's rights um or blasphemy laws is around defamation of religion um if we go back to the idea of what human rights are they belong to me or to all of you by virtue of us being human they don't belong to a religion they don't belong to an entity like a corporation 
They don't belong to an entity like a family. They belong to individuals, to human beings, maybe to human beings in a group. So minorities are a group of individuals, but religion can't be seen as an individual. Um, but countries saw this as an opportunity to try and advance other notions of human rights that would roll back on the rights they didn't like. Um, and for the first few years, it was fairly bleak. Um, many people who worked at the UN, at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, who were supporting, that's their job, is to support these bodies, wondered whether it was going to fail. Uh, many academics who I respect greatly wrote papers saying this is failing, it's going to fail, it's going to be disbanded, or the Western European and Latin American countries are going to pull out and therefore sort of leave it as a kind of shell in which like-minded countries will get together and discuss how to undermine human rights. But fortunately, these new membership rules meant that a lot of the countries that at the beginning joined in order to undermine the purpose of UN human rights bodies then didn't stay on for very long for membership. And we suddenly saw a new wave of countries. We were talking earlier um, about Sierra Leone, which joined the council um, and joined in, in a way of saying, we, we like the idea of human rights. We might not have great capacity, but we want to join in. We want to be a member. It's a prestigious thing to do. And it's also a good thing to do. Um, countries that were much more moderate in terms of their positions and who engaged in a way that was much more constructive. It stopped being so much about political allies and about advancing politics and became more about how do we work as a body. This was also helped massively by the Arab Spring. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation spans four of those five regional groups that I told you about. They're, they're not in Western European and others group, but they have members in all four of the other ones. The non-aligned movement, which comes from the Cold War days of you had the sort of US and its allies, Russia and its allies, and then every other country which became the non-aligned movement, um, spans again four of the five regions. Um, those blocks became less powerful during the Arab Spring because there were so many internal divisions uh, within Middle Eastern countries who had their own allies in their own regional groups that they stopped voting like a bloc which gave this kind of space to the Human Rights Council to get on with what it does. The only bloc that carried on was the European Union, which carries on voting as a bloc. They come up with the common position of all the member states, and then, which is often the low, lowest common denominator, and then they carry on as a bloc. But the European Union weren't really seeking to undermine the council in the way that other blocs were. And so we saw from about 2010, <laughs> that the council really started to fulfill its mandate. It started um, to do things like having panel sessions on um, sexual orientation and gender identity minorities and whether or not they should be protected in the way that women or children or people with disabilities or other vulnerable groups are protected by treaties and by other mechanisms. Um, we saw that there was an awful lot more dialogue between different regional groups and resolutions that were tabled between the African, uh, the African group and the Western European group, or resolutions that were across from the Latin countries over to the Asian countries, and that there was this spirit of, we're going to make this body work and work well. And Around this time, we'd come to the end of the first cycle of universal periodic review, you know, where all the countries are reviewed over a four and a half year period. And countries have really engaged with it well. They'd, um, they'd seen this as a good thing. They realized that having other countries ask them questions, provide them with recommendations and talk to them could provide a platform. Yes, a little bit for criticism, but mostly for engagement and for strengthening their human rights compliance. Um, in many ways, the engagement around politics is they didn't want to be named and shamed in front of their peers, but at the same time, their peers understood the complexities of being a state in a way that judges or human rights experts or NGOs don't understand the complexities of being a government or being a state. And um, we saw an increase in these special rapporteurs and these independent experts in the types of rights that they were looking at and the number of them. So. In previous sort of decades, it had really focused on civil and political rights, on torture, extrajudicial killing, um, 
that moved a little bit into economic and social rights, water and sanitation, food, the right to life. And then during the, during the sort of second phase of the Human Rights Council, that moved into third generation rights, the right to not have toxic waste dumped in your land, the right to a clean environment, the right to international solidarity, the rights, um, rights of vulnerable groups like what's called, and it's very pejorative, but the UN calls it the rights of peasants, which is people that don't have traditional land rights, but use land for arable farming, the rights of the elderly. Um, and so we saw this really good period, um, 2010, for about three or four years. And then again, the membership starts changing. And um, some of the more moderate states came off the council. And uh, the Arab Spring sort of was resolved-ish, if we take sort of Syria and Yemen and Libya and some of them out of the equation. But um, And all of a sudden, the dynamics change again. Um, and we're into what someone called yesterday under Chatham House Rules at a roundtable on the Human Rights Council, the bleak period. Because we now have a membership of the council that really looks like the initial membership. Um, we also have... a. I'm live streaming, aren't I? We also have um, a Donald Trump presidency and a Brexit. And we have a Putin. Um, Russia did not get voted back onto the council this year, which it's clearly not very happy about. And I'll explain to you why soon or how, it, how that's being manifested. Um, we have quite a lot of power has moved back to Cuba within the Latin American world. Um, and these are... These are problems if we're thinking about the Human Rights Council as a body in terms of what it does externally, but also in terms of its engagement internally with member states. It's becoming polarised and politicised again. Okay, so that's, that's my general overview. But what is the Human Rights Council, my students always ask me? Because it's not just a room in a building. It's not just the staff that support it and that run it all year round. But it's also not just the member states that sit at it, right? And this goes to the broader question of what is the UN? On the one hand, it's a forum within which member states meet one another and negotiate. But it's also an actor in and of its own right. <laughs> it's also an actor in and of its own right. Um, it's also a place in which we transcend scale. It's a place in which civil society, who may frequently not have access to the upper echelons of ambassadorial power, can have their voices heard, can hold events, can speak within the body, and can lobby and make changes. And so it, it sort of plays these three different roles. And yet when we talk about the UN failing on Syria, right, we're talking about the UN and we, we bring it back down to this singular as though the UN is one entity, which it's clearly not. The council in many ways is there to provide information, information to you, information to member states, information to people who watch it on web TV, hundreds of thousands of miles away. It provides the transparency in terms of discussions, it provides reports that are translated into six languages that are picked up by grassroots activists. It provides best practices and recommendations that member states, whether they are a member of the council or not, but members of the UN can pick up. It provides interactive dialogues with human rights experts and panel discussions on everything from sexual orientation and gender identity rights to a child's right to play. It provides a place where we can talk about throughout every session, there's an agenda and there's 10 agenda items and we can talk about any country in the world and we can talk about any human rights issue so long as it is tabled in advance. So from that point of view, from a sort of social constructivist point of view, the council works really well because it does information sharing and it does fact finding and it does dissemination of that work in an incredible way. But it's also an actor, right? And it's supposed to protect and promote human rights. But it doesn't have any teeth to do so. It doesn't have any binding powers. It can pass resolution after resolution and decision after decision, but there's no enforcement powers to back them up. So the council has passed 
many, many, far too many for me to know, many resolutions about Israel and almost as many now resolutions about Syria. But that doesn't mean that the occupation in Palestine has gone away. And it doesn't mean that the war in Syria is not continuing to kill tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of civilians. So a lot of people say, well, what's the point? Why are we passing these resolutions? Why is it passing resolutions on Iran when Iran won't even allow the human rights experts to come into the country? Why are we passing resolutions about sexual orientation and gender identity minorities when more than 70 countries in the world continue to criminalize people who are part of that minority? One of the, one of the things that an actor does isn't just about making the change on the ground for enforcement. It's about changing understanding and changing discourse. And it's about creating awareness of problems. So when the UN Human Rights Council writes a report or his, you know, takes on board a report of a special rapporteur or a commission of inquiry, say on North Korea, or as it did on Darfur, or as it's doing now on Syria, that information can go over to the Security Council, which does have enforcement powers, that does have teeth. Or that information can be picked up at the regional level, right? by in sort of regional institutions or by transnational actors who, again, have greater enforcement powers. It doesn't mean that they will do anything. We know Syria, the Security Council is failing time and again on Syria. But sometimes it does. You know, the UN Human Rights Council can write reports, an early warning report on Burundi, and suddenly we see that the UN Security Council is seized of Burundi and a genocide is averted in Burundi. It's not only because of what the Human Rights Council does, but it's certainly an actor within that machinery that's absolutely crucial. Similarly, on Crimea, it was the UN's human rights system that sort of sounded the alarm bells and sent in monitors to be in Crimea and avert a war between Russia and Ukraine. So it might not have its own teeth, but if we think about the council as part of a broader system, we see that its work as an actor is very important. What I particularly like is the civil society angle, because if you ever wander around the UN in New York, which you all could do, you could just say, I am a student, I'm an academic, I'd like a pass and they'll let you in. What you'll notice is that there's hardly any civil society actors in there because they're not allowed in. They're not allowed into the General Assembly unless there's a particular reason to have them in and then definitely not allowed into the Security Council. And that leaves a sort of gap of knowledge the depth of knowledge that single issue organizations have. Whereas at the Human Rights Council, you'll have the whole range from Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch to very single issue organizations that are looking at a very particular human right in a particular country. And that depth of knowledge, like the depth of knowledge of an academic, is absolutely crucial for member states to then take an issue forward. They rely on it heavily. And, um, for me, that aspect, the voices, clearly it's not the voices of the people, although some NGOs do bring in individual people who have had their rights violated to speak at the council. But it's at least a representation of people in the way that member states rarely represent the individual and in a way that UN staff rarely represent an individual. So I'm telling you lots of nice things about the Human Rights Council. Um, what's it done badly? because it takes many steps backwards. It's politicized. It's a political body full of member states who are themselves political. So um, as a former High Commissioner for Human Rights said, if you expect a political body not to be politicized, it's like expecting a fish not to be wet. Of course, there's political processes going on and member states trade votes with one another, not based necessarily on human rights. So it might be, I really want to buy your bananas for 30p. And so I'm going to vote on behalf of your resolution so that you give me a good trade deal. It might be as crude as that. It might be sort of more nuanced than that, which is, I know that you're a good ally of mine. This really doesn't matter too much. I called my government for instructions and they said, do what you want to do. And I really don't want to lose your sort of general support for other things I have going on. So, yes, it's political and it's politicized and we expect that. But sometimes that politicization wholly undermines its work. So, for example, um, Darfur, there was a genocide in Darfur towards the beginning of the Human Rights Council's uh, creation. And instead of criticising the genocide or calling for the government to stop the genocide, 
resolution after resolution was passed which praised the government for trying its best and for cooperating and called for all actors to the conflict to stop perpetrating the genocide. And yes, there was lots of focus, there were special sessions on Darfur and so on, but this idea that these resolutions kept calling to, at the, to the UN, saying the UN should build the government's capacity to stop perpetrating a genocide. There were similar issues around Sri Lanka when a genocide was being perpetrated against the Tamils. Um, a special session was called. The European Union couldn't get its act together quickly enough to table a, a draft resolution for this special session that it wanted that was really focusing in on that genocide. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka had got all its allies together and tabled a resolution that praised Sri Lanka. Um, it's um, it's a, a political game. It's a game of risk sometimes. And no matter how hard the body works to do good, those kind of politicization aspects will always come in. Can we criticize it for behaving that way? No, but can we criticize the countries within it for behaving that way? Yes. But who are those countries? If the UK wants to act, it has to call out the Foreign Office in London and ask for instructions. There was an amazing ambassador from Somalia um, who unfortunately died uh, recently in post, I think, who was brilliant. And every time the Somali ambassador called home for instructions of how to behave in, in the Human Rights Council, the government just said, um, we've got really much bigger things to worry about, like really just get on with it, do what you want to do. Um, sometimes we can criticise a government back home for how a country behaves. And sometimes we can criticise an ambassador because they are simply running around doing what they want to do, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. It's never as easy as just saying member states are wrong. You have to look at each one individually. And it's never as simple as saying, oh, well, you know, China doesn't like human rights. There are many human rights China likes. There's many human rights it doesn't. It's the same with the UK. You have to look at each aspect and each, and each thing that comes up. But the two things that demonstrate to me, I'll finish on a really positive note with the story, why the Human Rights Council is working and why it's working well have happened over the last 10 years. So the first one I sort of talked about briefly and I'll explain properly is around this battle to have defamation of religion become a human right, which would then override an individual's right to freedom of expression or freedom of religion. And the second one is around something that's happened two days ago, it's still going on, but it's really happened two days ago, around protecting sexual orientation and gender identity minorities. And the two things sort of go hand in hand, they're parallels. Um, starting from about 2000, there was this movement of let's start protecting religions from being defamed. And that really picked up speed when the Human Rights Council was, was created. Countries said, listen, you, you created this universal declaration and these initial treaties on human rights long before we had a voice at the table and you didn't take into account what our human rights are or our, our, how we view human rights and you've imposed these kind of Western standards on us. What is freedom of expression? What is freedom of religion? This doesn't work for us. And so therefore you ought to take into, and this is, I mean, this is a very valid point of view, sort of the kind of third world approaches to, to international law generally and to human rights law or cultural relativist approaches and so on. You ought to take into account what we see as human rights. So within the sort of African human rights system, you have rights holders being individuals, families, societies, communities, right? But still made up of individuals. Um, and so they sort of picked up this mantra and they said, we should have, <coughs> we should have this idea of um, religion, right? I as a, I or we as religious people, um, sorry. Our religion ought to be protected from being defamed. Um, and defamation can come in many forms. It can be a spoken form, it can be a pictorial form, it can be a written form. But if our religion is defamed or if religion is defamed, then that would be a violation of our rights and therefore it would be an abuse and that sort of might justify imprisonment or a death penalty or whatever it might be, the sanctions. And of course, that doesn't really sit well with just sort of traditional notions and understandings of why human rights came about. Human rights came about to protect the individual, the, the weakest part of international law against the state, which was the most powerful part of international law. 
It wasn't there to protect other entities because other entities don't necessarily need that same kind of protection. If we think back to sort of the ideas of Nazi Germany and the ideas that a state could do anything it wanted against its own population, then the individual has to be at the heart of, of international human rights law. But it took a good 10 years to push back against this notion that religion might be an entity that's a rights holder. Um, and it took an awful lot of political trade-offs and negotiations. Um, and then it also took the right context of the Arab Spring and countries sort of backing down because they actually had bigger things to worry about at that time. Um, and as that was sort of drifting away, there suddenly became this kind of movement towards, can we start protecting the family or traditional values as a rights holder? Um, and that movement was coming about because we were seeing across sort of the global north or the Western hemisphere, the Latin countries and the Western European and others countries, a movement towards greater protection for sexual orientation and gender identity rights. Um, whether those rights were around violence or whether those rights were around non-discrimination. Um, so in some countries it might be marriage equality, in some countries it might have been about um, employment legislation, in some countries it might simply have been about decriminalisation. And there's more than 70 countries in, of the UN's 193 member states that still criminalise either people or behaviours that fall within those broad categories. And as these rights started to be advanced at national and regional and international levels, um, there was a similar kind of pushback of, hold on a minute, this doesn't square with our understandings of what we want to happen domestically or our notions what, of what human rights are. And there started to be resolutions tabled about how can we protect traditional values? How can we tr protect the family? And discussions would happen, particularly with some of the African countries, where there were sort of people would say to them, listen, you're talking about the family as male, female um, and children. You're not thinking about grandparent care, which occurs in a lot of countries where there's urbanization and sort of, you know, the, the middle generation go off to work in cities and there's grandparent care. Uh, you're not talking about foster caring. You're not talking about single parent families. You know, forget the forget the sort of the family that you're trying to exclude here, right? The gay family. You're also not taking into account all sorts of other family structures um, that are prevalent. Um, but very little traction was made, and there was this kind of constant tension between the two. And in 2011, South Africa said, "Let's have a panel at the Human Rights Council on LGBT rights." And the, the, Arab, the Arab Spring was still going on that year and the resolution passed. And the following year, the panel happened and all organization of Islamic cooperation states got up and walked out the room at the time of the panel. The sort of single filed out on web TV. Um, and after that, South Africa came under a lot of pressure from its African allies, even though it's in its constitution to protect LGBT minorities. And it didn't table a resolution again. And it started joining in with the let's protect the family, let's protect the traditional values resolutions. And this has sort of been the battleground at the Human Rights Council over the last four years. Um, the culmination of that battleground, I'm mindful of time, but the culmination of that battleground was um, that the Latin American countries for whom LGBT rights are very sort of crucial in terms of what they, what they want to advance and promote, um, spent two years trying to get together enough support to have a new independent expert, a new sort of special rapporteur that goes into countries and writes these reports and these recommendations and these best practices and criticisms and so on, on that subject. And in, how I turn this off? Marvellous. In, <laughs> in June last year, um, there was a vote that was voted, can you hear me at the back? There was a vote that was voted on 23 to 17 or something with eight abstentions. I'm rubbish at maths, but something like that. It wasn't a full majority of the council, but enough support had been gained around around this issue that the vote passed. Um, it was a really contentious vote and this new mandate was created, this new independent expert. And the Human Rights Council has to report back to the General Assembly every year. <laughs> And um, every year it says, here's our report of the four sessions that we've done. Here's all our resolutions that we've passed. And the General Assembly passes a resolution saying we accept or we adopt the annual report of the Human Rights Council. This has been going on for 10 years and for 10 years that's what it's done. Um, and then all of a sudden, 
this very contentious mandate gets passed, not by a full majority, but it doesn't have to be passed by a full majority. And um, there's a whole bunch of countries, 193 minus 47, so whatever's left, right? They weren't in the room for that vote. They couldn't vote on it. They weren't members of the council at that time. But they were members of the General Assembly. And they said, we don't like this. We didn't want this. We were, we were either gunning for protecting the family, or at least we were not wanting this because you know, we might have legislation at home, whether it's criminal laws, whether it's employment laws that will need to be changed if, if this vulnerable group, a little bit like with the whole women issue in you know, 1960, when, when it was suddenly realized that women were going to be protected as a vulnerable group within the UN family, countries were like, oh, wow, hold on. Does that mean um, we're going to have to allow women to be soldiers or women to be monarchs or women to drive or whatever it might mean, right? There, there's sort of implications domestically once a vulnerable group is recognized as being discriminated against. And so about three weeks ago, it was suddenly announced that at the General Assembly, the General Assembly wanted to reopen the Human Rights Council report and get rid of this resolution. And <coughs> all of a sudden, and I've been watching this on listserv and it's been brilliant, there's all these member states as a group have been getting together and all these civil society, I think like 1,500 civil society organizations from around the world have been getting together <laughs> and mobilizing and lobbying governments and saying, you can't reopen this. The Human Rights Council has passed it, right? The battle's over, like except that you lost the battle, stop trying to sort of... Um, and for the first sort of week, it looked like this would be overturned. And everyone within the Human Rights Council world said, this is ridiculous. You've given us a mandate. We are a body to advance the protection and promotion of human rights. How can the General Assembly suddenly come along and say they don't like what we did? If they didn't like what we did, you shouldn't have created us, disband us. But you can't, you can't on the one hand say, this is your job, and then say, okay, but if you didn't do it properly in the way that we like it, then we're overturning it. Um, <laughs> on Monday, they finally had the vote. The vote kept being postponed because um, the people that proposed this, this amendment, let's take this resolution out, weren't sure whether or not they were going to get enough votes. And Monday was the last day that the vote could be. And I think the vote... They, they didn't manage to overturn the mandate, but the vote was so close, there were sort of eight votes between it and there were about 20 abstentions. And no one knew until the vote what would happen. And this is really the site of the current battleground. There'll be another battleground in five years' time, right? There was a, there was a long period of time where everyone at the Human Rights Council really thought that we would end up with blasphemy laws being justified by human rights laws, uh, where people being put to death or for exercising freedom of expression would be justified by human rights laws. And I think currently there's a lot of people that still think that the 70 countries that continue to criminalize, to torture, to put people to death for being soji minorities will continue. At some point, the Human Rights Council will have won this battle. They've already won it by getting it this far, by making it within the public domain in this way. This battle is it's not won. There'll be many, many more sort of skirmishes along the way, but it's won. And then there'll be the next battle. And then there'll be the next one. And I suppose my positivity around political bodies is if this had been a court that had said to do this, or if this had been an expert body that would have said to do this, countries would have ignored it. But because it was a political body made up of their peers that said, you're going to do this, countries have to listen. And because civil society have been involved every step of the way, and they're the ones at the grassroots level, organizing and protesting and being activists and everything else and garnering the support on the ground in every country, governments have to do this. And so when people say the Human Rights Council fails because it doesn't do this or the Human Rights Council fails because it is complicit in that, the Human Rights Council doesn't do its work properly, doesn't do enough of it. It's the same with the UN. It's probably the same with every government in the world. But um, there is a good aspect to the politicization as well as a bad aspect. I have rambled on for long enough. Um, I'd be very happy to answer any questions, especially the gentleman at the back that keeps nodding. Um, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> not the okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of food for thought. Um, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Um, I'm not going to try to summarize of what you've just uh, what you've just spoken no. about for the past forty minutes. I think it raises lots of interesting questions and lots of gestures to lots of sort of uh, debates about what is the function of this body, which I think I was expecting us to disagree an awful lot more. But you finished <laughs> up 
on a line which I couldn't agree with more, which is this it's a political body and we need to expect this. Um, the Human Rights Council has always been, and the Commission before, it has always been one of my favorite bodies of the UN because I just enjoy their wrangling over this stuff because maybe I'm a bit of a skeptic <laughs> and a bit agnostic about actual the ability of, of states to sort of really implement human rights but hearing them argue about it is it's very interesting to find out how do they actually feel about these these issues so i think you've done a really good job of telling us where that lies at the moment um the human rights council when it was established i think we do have lots of llm students and students of public international law in here uh when the human rights council was established one of the lines that became very frequent was that it was old wine in a new bottle which I mean, it sounds like a good thing. Is it old wine? Good. <laughs> um, so what's the problem with that? But uh, I think you've shown us that actually there are differences. The Universal Periodic Review, the special procedures have changed the dynamics of the council, have maybe emboldened the council, have maybe given it more credibility. Um, but human rights is still part of a, a game, a game of risk, a political game. So good. Maybe we can uh, just open the floor to questions. Does anyone want to get the ball rolling, Josh? <laughs> Well, I mean, I'd be, I'd be good, but I always get in trouble for asking too many questions. That's okay. I, 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 that sounds okay. Um, thank you very much. That was fantastic. And more, I don't know a huge amount about the UN. It might be worth introducing yourself just so she knows who's in the room uh, and, yeah, and so on. Josh Harris. I'm a postdoc at uh, Melbourne University. Um, so, yeah, the more I learn about the UN Human Rights Council, been to a few of the business and human rights uh, forums in Geneva, so I can kind of know what you think about the vibe in the air, so that was an addition to my tool. Um, what I'll, it's not really a question, but it's, I was nodding so I was in agreement with <laughs> pretty much everything you were saying, right? but I, I wondered whether we're seeing same time as we're seeing a lot of books talking about the end of human rights or you know the, the last utopia etc 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 um we're seeing more of a rejuvenation in a lot of areas it doesn't just seem like it depends on where you're looking but it just seems to be a different thing um but i wonder whether in, to a certain extent we're sort of seeing the end of a legal conceptualization of human rights or not that there were always was just a legal conception, but we're, we're seeing a bit of a sea change in the way that we generally think of human rights. Um, and whether you sort of, I, A, agreed with that, and B, sort of where you thought that was going to take us in the future. I mean, I think for all that people like me criticise human rights bodies, they work far better than many of the other issue area bodies, right? So if we think about climate and the environment, right, and the successes that we've had in human rights in terms of moving forward, in terms of getting member states on board, even the most sceptical ones. Member states don't want to say, I don't like women, I don't like children. So they start ratifying these treaties. And once they start ratifying them, they can be held slightly more to account. And even if it's incremental, whereas we see the environmental treaties, right? Um, you know, they, many states just don't even see that they need to ratify them, they need to be in the room, or if they do, then it lasts for only as long as that particular person's in power, right? Um, so I think because these human rights bodies and mechanisms work well, what we've seen is not so much the end, I don't agree with Samuel Moyne on this at all, the, sort of the end of human rights. What we've seen is that issues that are related to human rights, whether it's the environment, whether it's war, whether it's, you know, business, they the impact upon human rights are being brought into the human rights arena because those mechanisms function so much better and are far stronger and countries pay far more attention to them so if we're talking about how do we hold multinational corporations accountable for all of the things that they do wrong if we frame it in a human rights lens and we start talking about compliance in terms of modern day slavery or in terms of supply chains but we but we use the human rights bodies to do that for accountability because that's the other thing. These bodies are great at monitoring and accountability because states take them seriously and because NGOs take them seriously, reports are submitted and shadow reports are submitted and it's a wealth of information. Um, and so I don't say it's the end of human rights. I don't say it's human rights being diluted. I see it as 
this demonstrates the need for far stronger mechanisms elsewhere. But until we get stronger mechanisms elsewhere, then yes, of course, let's use Geneva for the Business and Human Rights Forum. Let's, of course, use the treaty bodies to monitor the sustainable development goals, because if the information and the infrastructure and the fact finding is there, then why not roll it out more broadly? Of course, there are some states that want to have things like the right to an equitable and democratic order, and that's clearly not aimed at anything other than let's take some resources away and kind of muddy the water of what human rights are. But I think that they're, they're always a kind of tiny minority that sort of the right wing neocons like to focus on in order to say we're not engaging with the body as opposed to being the majority. I mean, I think, I think I'm terrified about what's going on right now. Like, that's the starting point. I'm less worried about the Human Rights Council than I am about the general world. Um, and the reason for that is when we had the financial crash in 2008, the Human Rights Council was a very new body with a very poor membership in terms of, you know, countries were actually wanting to build up this body and engage in human rights. And it weathered the storm um, because there needs to be a principal human rights body within the UN and enough countries within the UN recognized its necessity and took leadership within the body despite, despite the implications of the crash for human rights, particularly economic and social rights, but for human rights generally across the board. I think there will be a vacuum. Russia did not get voted onto the Human Rights Council. Russia were, were at the fore of trying to reopen up this general, uh, within the General Assembly, reopen up the, the Human Rights Council annual report. Russia will try and attack the Human Rights Council because it wasn't voted back on. I Do I think Donald Trump is going to have an administration that engages very well with it or sends a really good ambassador out there? Probably not. Um, do I think that the US will continue to fund UN work generally and the human rights work specifically in the way that it has? Probably not. Do I think that the UK, for as much as I hate Brexit, do I think the UK is probably in a stronger position now to take leadership because it's not tied to a common position or if it does Brexit, it's not tied to a common position? Yes. Um, do I think that the UK violates human rights? Yes. But is it one of the best possible options for leadership at the council? Yes. And it's very good. Um, it's in terms of its mission in Geneva, it's very strong, whether it's on or off the council, it's it's always been the leader. Um, the Latin American countries give me great hope, not all of them, but many of them operating as a group give me great hope, as do countries like Vietnam. Um, countries that have stepped up, there's a number of, of smaller states that have stepped up that have wanted to engage over recent years. I think there's enough of a critical mass of countries that want the council to continue um, and that will use the council well, my worry more broadly is that the rise in these kind of nationalistic views and policies lead to a situation where many issues get swept off the table for fear of political backlash. So we saw for years that no one talks about the migrant crisis. Um, I'm not talking about migration crisis. I mean, the migrant crisis of dead bodies on beaches. For f people didn't talk about it in human rights bodies for fear of upsetting the European Union. Right. People didn't talk about it in human rights bodies for fear of upsetting the Australians. Um, I think there will be many more issues that take a long time to appear in front of these bodies for fear of upsetting the many countries that are seeing the rise of nationalism and and because of the political backlash that will come from it. I should put a footnote here that myself and Ben have written something recently about the Human Rights Council, which we thought would disagree more with. And that widely criticizes everything I've ever written. Yeah, a bit, a bit. <laughs> Excellent, I look forward to yeah. reading it. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
the commission and creates a one page to exit this change. But then very early on in, in the talk, uh, you declare, you know, political institutions go to be political intersections, political institutions go to be political decisions. And then this so called moderate period that shapes from 2010 to, to 13 to 14, like less politicized. I'm wondering if that just means that it's just a, 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 politi a style of politics, if you like, you know, a better style of politics, and therefore a depoliticized one. And yet the concept persists. So, so I'm just wondering whether there might, is there something endearing about the concept of, of politicization that it, it, it's valuable? But at the same time, um, the Security Council, for example, is a healthy political institution that makes political decisions. And we see a lot of this sort of political gameplay. Um, at play within the Security Council. I'm wondering whether it's something about human rights institutions that this concept um, becomes, um, comes to the fore for some reason. So I think the starting point is I would probably criticise a lot of what I've written on the Human Rights Council um, in terms of I think I've changed as the body's changed and I think a number of the staff members and, and, and states that I know have changed in terms of how we view what's gone on and, and and it's a big plea that people should do more observational research, that actually by being there and seeing the processes and the engagement gives an understanding. And as the council has changed, um, and I think as it changes further, my mind will change more. At the moment, I'm in this idea of good corruption, bad corruption, good politicization, bad politicization, or what I like to call pernicious politicization. Um, you know, sometimes you need good corruption. You need to be able to bribe the local, uh, members of a, like parties to a war in order to get aid through. And sometimes it's bad corruption because you know that by bribing them, that money is going to be used to harm that same civilian population that you're taking the aid to, right? And the idea that we have binaries, right? That, you know, corruption's always bad, right? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's a nuanced thing. And I think the same today, <laughs> maybe not tomorrow, today more so than five years ago, um, Five years ago, when I when I sort of wrote that book and I unpacked what is politicization in relation to the Human Rights Council, there wasn't very much written in law, if anything, that unpacked politicization from a legal point of view. Right? It was just an accepted concept within political science, but I couldn't understand it in relation to a mandate, right? To a legal mandate and to a resolution and to that that aspect. Um, today, I see that politicization can often be for the good, right? I'm sure there were loads of vote swapping around this sexual orientation and gender identity mandate that I'll never know about. Vote swapping on issues that I might say, oh, well, you know, I really wanted that resolution to pass. Why did you make that not pass? And then suddenly you see the bigger picture and that politicization makes sense, right? Apparently by WhatsApp. Yeah, oh, the WhatsApp thing's yeah. brilliant. So the, these, lots of these ambassadors are on WhatsApp groups and they WhatsApp each other during meetings, right? <laughs> but there's countries like Canada that don't allow their delegates, or at least in New York, I hope it's still not on camera, um, <laughs> it might be, um, countries like them, maybe not necessarily, them, don't allow them to have WhatsApp, and then they're excluded from the party. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of this stuff going on, this, um, you know, this vote, this bartering, constant bartering, but we kind of, we kind of expect that because we see that at the domestic level, and we kind of see that amongst friendship groups, and we kind of just see that in human behaviour. So, Sometimes if you take a snapshot and you say, oh, why was that resolution passed? I don't like that resolution and you don't see it within the context, you see it as bad politicization. What I think of as pernicious politicization is when it's something wholly unrelated to human rights that seeks to undermine them. Now at the Security Council, there are, you know, there are factors why there's never been a resolution on China and Tibet, right? There are factors why there's never been a resolution that calls for sanctions or coercive measures or whatever against Israel. There are also, but they're never, they're never unrelated to the situation and they're never seeking to undermine the issue of having international peace and security. It's because there are, uh, what's the word? Diametrically opposite views on a situation. Whereas something like protection of the family is not diametrically opposite opposing views on what human rights are it we don't like a particular right 
And we are not only seeking to block it, we're seeking to block it forever and ever and undermine it and undermine the whole concept of human rights altogether by moving away what rights holders are and to take this so far that it becomes pernicious rather than keeping it about that particular situation. Not that I'm saying that the Security Council is not a politicised body, not that I'm saying that it works brilliantly, not that I'm saying that I'm a critical friend of the UN, but not that I'm saying that I wouldn't, if I could, create something different or reform it, if it was possible to do whole scale reform in that way. But um, this idea of, of good politicisation, bad politicisation, I think is is an important one to unpack and can only be seen with, you know, the lens of of history rather than being seen session by session. And I suspect that's why very early on, Francois Hampson or Nico Shriva and, you know, really excellent scholars were just saying, wash our hands of this, right? Oh, one in New Boston, this is, this is all going to pop. Whereas now, if you read things, I try not to read things about universal periodic review because there's just not been enough cycles to really be able to unpack it. But when I read stuff about special sessions or special procedures or the Human Rights Council from scholars, they've now got 33 sessions and have many special sessions where they can start looking at it holistically rather than this snapshot of, oh, it's all going horribly wrong. Okay. Well, that's the road that you know I don't know human rights and <laughs> I'm, I'm real into a friend of creative rights. But I'm interested just in, I suppose, particularly that response crystallised some themes, which is, so against what measure and way are you evaluating this? So it does all just seem from the outside really subjective and this idea of good politicisation and bad politicisation the fact that it's not theorised in the political science literature. So isn't it just what you agree with? Like ultimately? It's difficult. It really right. is because it's not on one hand it's law, right? So it's you can take a complaint to a human rights treaty body and say there was forced sterilisation and that uh, that violates this fundamental right and you can gain remedies for that or at least the treaty body can recommend remedies and it can go back to the country and the country can actually actualise it and change policies, right? Within the Human Rights <coughs> Council, they're not really looking at specific allegations of violations against specific individuals. They're looking at situations and it might be a country situation it might be a thematic situation, it might be across the world or it might be on a very local level, but it's not looking at it through the lens of mediation, arbitration, courts or any or changes, you know, in that way of remedying the individual. It's actually looking much more at practices and policies and how can you help either the countries that want to do it, so promoting it through education, awareness, raising, support, capacity building, or the countries that don't want to do it, how can you name and shame them, how can you coerce them, how can you use the information you have to move it to bodies that have more pressure and so it's sort of that separation out of this is a forum really for member states and and non-state actors in the shape of civil society or international sort of agencies who whomever to get together and really try and advance human rights generally as opposed to courts which are or quasi-judicial bodies which are much more about there is a specific allegation um and i don't, i mean i I don't see it as a legal body. I see it as having laws. It's got frameworks of how it works. It's got a constituent instrument. It's got processes that govern by law. But the human rights that are discussed there aren't really so much the actual laws on human rights. They're the kind of, what someone called last night, human goods that will eventually become human rights and then will eventually become human rights law. I don't know if that answers your question. So it's more about process. Often it is. The, the politics and processes are the really... So if we think about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that's not law. It's not binding in any way. And that came through political processes from about, you know, from the um, sort of the Atlantic Charter, um, sort of during the Second World War between the US and the UK about thinking about in the brave new world, what are the important things? And then there were political processes and discussions that led to the Universal Declaration. And then the Universal Declaration itself became politicised when it became law because we split it into civil and political rights and economic and social and cultural rights because one side of the Cold War didn't like civil and political rights and the other side didn't like economic, social and cultural rights. So already it's still politics and processes. And even then, once the treaties are created, countries can choose which treaties they sign up to. Still politics and processes. And only at that point do they have a legal duty to give effect to them domestically. 
So but I'm also a heretic in this. Maybe we will disagree on this. International law has legal elements, but it's not. Retains this status of law because the people that practice law as it are domestically trained lawyers who are trained to think of it as law. But it's sorry, it's much it's much more of a hybrid between law and politics than the legal systems and legal understanding that we spend years being trained in. The only reason I, the only reason I would disagree with that is not my plug, plug, plug your ears because uh, that's not true. It's just that the domestic analogy doesn't work because the domestic aspect of the law politics, politics, yeah. they're just different. But you're right. I, I agree. Sorry. I, I, need to, I need to get that off my chest. That's all right. Can, uh, can I, that leads, that, that whole discussion leads neatly along to my question, I think. Um, it's, it's very similar to, to Marie's question, really, but taking into account. Um, Do you know who you are? Well, okay. <laughs> um, well um, but my question is, is around, so Marie was asking about, well, what's the yardstick for measuring this? What, what politicization as against what? And actually what you've just told us is that our yardstick is kind of problematic. Human rights are problematic foundationally. They're aspirations of Yeah, aspirations. So that leads me to what I think is the most exciting thing about the Human Rights Council as it stands. And I think what myself and Ben have like written about at this point, which is that the Human Rights Council, because of this geographic distribution, the way in which it's, it's changed from the sort of Western dominated institution where Western ideas of human rights are sort of hegemonic, we now have new conceptions of rights. And is there, do you think that there's room to maneuver within this? It's not, this is not just about politicization. This is about different conceptions. Um, communist perceptions of rights, Russian perceptions or, or uh, Soviet perceptions on rights, third world perspective, group perspectives on rights, that human rights as we know them, maybe they need to be subject to change at any rate and the legal system as we know it needs overhauling. <laughs> Um, I think, look, I think, I think lots of perspectives on rights were represented in the Universal Declaration, um, and lots weren't. Mm. Um, and I think that the right to leisure, or the child's right to play panel, right, I can sort of smile when I say them, um, or the equitable and democratic order are not examples of rights that are representing, you know, real, um, they're not representing sort of cultures that weren't voices that weren't represented at that time. Um, and I think there is a lot of trying to dilute the international human rights law system because, as I said, about mechanisms, because it works, countries that don't like human rights try and dilute it with other things. But we've also seen the advancement of conceptions of rights that weren't represented. Um, whether it's about third world, conceptions, whether it's about sort of group rights and vulnerability, you know, there was this Western idea and even Eastern European idea that vulnerability was women, vulnerability was children, but this idea of peasants as a vulnerable group, this idea of the elderly, these, these ideas are now coming in, in a way that no one was open to 20 years ago. And there are other rights that are being advanced. I mean, my favourite one is the right to peace. Is there a human right to peace? Peace is something more than the absence of war. And it's really, and I won't go into it for hours, but it started with Costa Rica that has always had peace within its constitution. There have been court cases to stop Costa Rica being involved in anything that might one day tangentially lead to a nuclear weapon. Children are educated in peace. It's demilitarized. You have similar court cases in Japan. Um, there was this whole sort of civil society movement, sort of Spanish-led and Spanish-speaking civil society movement. It started to move along. We might have a right to peace in 1997. There was this whole sort of declaration. And then suddenly countries went, oh, wow, right to peace. Why is Sri Lanka and Syria supporting this involvement of the right to peace as a human right? Could it be because if it's a human right, then, and Sri Lanka at the time is a big one, if this is a human right and it's enshrined, then if Sri Lanka is slaughtering Tamils, that would stop any country or the UN from intervening because they have a human right to peace, so you can't come on here. So that it, that's always my favorite example because on the one hand it's representing a myriad of voices that weren't represented at the time and trying to advance these rights 
And at the other time, you're always going to have the pernicious politicization of human rights, where some countries jump on the bandwagon to do something that isn't just not about that right, but actually seeks to fundamentally undermine it and undermine human rights law. So I think, yes, the opportunities are there incrementally, yeah. often through a backdoor route. Um, but we also have to be really wary of those opportunities. Good. We definitely have a little bit more time for questions. So we're currently free to to men on questions. <laughs> so if that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm Calvi Berger, the if you have a right to human rights of peace, how would you enforce it, if not for? <laughs> I mean, it could be through banning arms sales. Right. right? Um, it would require all countries to sign up to it, because otherwise one country is going to be left with loads of arms, <laughs> or making them and not being able to sell them. I don't know. But I don't think when we create rights, we worry so much about how we enforce it. Because often, creating a right changing the discourse. I always think about your friend Francois Crapeau. He's, he's the special rapporteur on the human rights of migrants. And at the beginning of his mandate, the, you know, the six-year mandate that's coming to an end, he really wanted to change the language from illegal migrant to irregular migrant. And I kept saying to him, you know, like, you've got this mandate. You can go out and visit any country. Like, what's going on? He said, Rosa, if we can change the discourse, if Reuters, which did, and The Guardian, which did, stop reporting people as illegal, and call them irregular, we will stop as a, as a public thinking about them as criminal or unlawful, and we'll think about them as people who have moved irregularly, right? Changing the discourse is a starting point for changing, well, and we also know that law often catches up with society, right? Change the discourse, change the perceptions, change the society, and the laws will follow. Um, am I a big proponent of the right to peace as a separate entity to an absence of war? I'm a skeptic, but I like the idea. I mean, in, in Oslo, um, they've now created an international law textbook that teaches international law through the prism of peace, not through war, which I think is fantastic if you're looking for a new public international law textbook. Um, it's, um, but it's not good enough to support you. It needs to have a critical mass, and I don't think we're there yet. Um, but I don't think anyone is worrying yet about the enforcement. It's more about changing perceptions, changing discourses before we worry about getting the law and then getting the enforcement. Yeah, that was a cop-out answer, wasn't it? Well, it does raise that question because when we talk about the Universal Declaration and you see the four freedoms, we talked about this in our public international law lecture last week, the four freedoms were, uh, they were uh, the device of the Roosevelt's to justify yeah. human rights regime, but they were used to encourage people to support the war effort. Yeah. Uh, so human rights, so there is a, there is a horrible connection between rights and war that we can't get away from. You know, this guy's writing PhD on it. <laughs> Let's go to war to stop human rights violations. I'm kidding, but you know, yeah. it, it's a... <laughs> There's a horrible connection between sovereignty, and it goes back to the person who's asking about nationalism, where Spain is sovereignty and war. And I think one of the reasons that we're building walls, physical walls and literal walls, and I say we, we might not have voted for it, but we are complicit in this, right, all of us, whether it's because we don't go out and campaign enough, whether it's because we don't care enough, whether it's because whatever. This building of walls and nationalism, I believe, has come about because people are terrified. Sovereignty has been over for years. That If you look at Krasner, he says there are four types of sovereignty that you need, and one of them is about being totally inter independent, and no state is independent. Every state is interdependent for many things, right? There is no such thing as sovereignty anymore. And as things crumble, we saw this in the 1990s, you know, with the dissolution of countries, as things crumble, nationalism comes in, as people get scared about what's going to happen next, globalised world, whatever it is, people get scared and wars go up. Um, sovereignty leads to wars. I'm not sure that globalisation doesn't lead to wars, but I'm hoping it will lead to fewer wars than we've had over the last few hundred years. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for uh, one or two last questions. I'd really like to hear from some of our undergraduates
mean that this is a sexual right and things like that, but that it'll be very hard to roll back the law in any kind of state. But at the level of of the actual state, like piercing that sovereign bill, I, I would I'm interested to know what you think about the role of shaming, naming and shaming and the attempt to, to coerce bills because most types, there's two main types of human rights. There are ones that happen in sort of emergencies or non-normal situations like Syria or Sri Lanka, where human rights abuses occur, but they also have a compelling rationale. Yeah. We shouldn't say those rationales are correct, but they are very compelling. Naming and shaming may not necessarily mean that it's compelling. Or the other ones, you have things like the oppression of women or homosexuals in countries where these policies are, are deeply imbricated. They have a compelling social logic, which is, again, this is the same logic that's right, but condemnation at an international level is just one very minor factor that policymakers would be able to add to. So I'm wondering, like, do you see, is, is naming and shaming something that we do because it's necessary to go through the motions, or do you see it as having a real emancipatory role? I think naming and shaming is the best tool that the United Nations has. Right? Ambassadors, sorry to the camera, ambassadors, you know, are elite, incredibly brilliant, sometimes nepotistic, right, depending on what country they're from, but they are all up there as a representative of a government, and they have to report back, whether they are the sister or brother of a government, or whether they are the creme de la creme, and they've been appointed in the most sort of transparent way. And if they are sitting in a room where other countries are criticising them, and they have to report back to capital that that happened, and it's on public record, and there are resolutions, they're not going to be very happy. And certainly their government's not going to be very happy because they are the mouthpiece of the government. And whether the naming and shaming happens by troops from the Congo being barracked and sent home because their military are not dealing with allegations of sexual violence and peacekeeping, and Congo being shamed at the UN and being told you can't give any troops for a year, and the, that kind of shame, or whether it's through universal periodic review, which... I always find it fascinating that China sends the highest possible delegation to sit at its universal periodic review and spends a good year beforehand lobbying governments not to make too difficult recommendations and often does really good things on human rights in that year. Why? Because they don't want to be shamed when they're sitting in a room and everyone's criticising them and asking them questions and making recommendations. I think that works far better than experts coming in and doing it because a, a, a ambassador um, an ambassador can turn around to their government and say, yeah, that expert criticised us, but you know that expert comes from this country or this lens or this whatever, and it doesn't matter so much, and it wasn't in such a public setting, and no one heard it because it was in an expert body and only other experts heard it. When they are named and shamed publicly in any of the UN fora, but particularly in the Human Rights Council, where all eyes are on it and it's live on web TV, and it's other governments turning around and saying, um, you know, why did you put in prison that political dissident? Why are they not out? Why is it that you just threw all these people off their land to build the Olympic Village, right? Or whatever it might be, not, not in this country, I speak of China. <laughs> uh, I don't think they call it a village. But, you know, in 2008, when, when those questions were being asked, the shamefulness comes from the fact that it's coming from their allies or the people that they work with or from their foes and that it's so publicly done. So I do think it's a key political tool. Um, Obviously, naming and shaming Assad is not going to help. Right? We're not talking about naming and shaming where it comes to like wars and chemical weapons. It's more about naming and shaming on policies, and, and I think that's what NGOs do really well, because NGOs can expose on the ground very particular things that have happened. Um, I think they did this with Russia and the US for years. I can't remember when, and I'm not going to try it, but um, that every time um, the US went to see Russian ambassadors, and I think they did it for China as well, um, every time delegations went to see them, not even necessarily US people, NGOs, whomever, but also at the highest level, at the presidential level, they would say names of political dissidents. What's happened to this person? What's happened to that person? And suddenly those people would become released, right? Because no one wants to be shamed by their peers. Um, so yes, while it sounds like it's a really soft option, it's actually one of the most effective ones, at least within the human rights world. Any last questions or are we done? Last burning questions? No, good. I think we had a, I'm keeping scores these days on um, allowing men to ask questions since we need an even balance. I think it was about a six to 
Yeah. Sorry, you've done better than the UN, which is still on zero with Secretary General. So. There you go. Yeah. Well, we had a female chair and a female presenter, so maybe it balances it all out. Good. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your questions. And particular thanks to Rosa for a really interesting, super talk on the Human Rights Council and the UN. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll get you back in five or six years so you can tell us whether or not it's what the dynamics have been since then. Once I've read your article, I'm never coming back. No, <laughs> it's... <laughs> you like our article. It's Excellent. not critical of you. It's, uh, okay. uh, it's a love-in for the Human Rights Council. Uh, good. Thank you all. Really? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> No, it's not an art, but it's the commission of human rights. It's, it's, it's more mainly a very boring democratic piece on the um, commission of inquiry establishing powers of the 